Okay, I think I, I'm going to start, so I will gain five minutes more for me. And uh, have you ever heard about etcd? Sure. You know what is etcd? Yes? Yes? Yes, okay, perfect. So, okay, first of all, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I would like to thank the organizers for accepting this talk, and today we're going to talk about how to post exploit a compromised etcd. Uh, but first, let me introduce myself. I'm Luis Toro, and I start on the offensive side of security in 2019. And for the past two years, I've been working as a security consultant at NCC Group. And here you have uh, um, some details about me and some badges. And the thing is, the core concept behind this technique is not completely shiny new. Yep. And there have been other talks in past editions of QCon that have already discussed the importance of HCD within the cluster. And you have here just a couple of examples. In the first talk, Joe Betts released a tool that has been the central focus for developing this technique. And I will talk to you about this tool later on. And for those you may not be familiar with cybersecurity terms, it's um, important to define what uh, post-exploitation means. And it refers to the techniques that an attacker employs after gaining uh, unauthorized access to, to a system. So consequently, post-exploitation techniques always come at the end of the, of the workflow of the security exercises because it implies that at this stage, we have already compromised uh, one asset and we want to establish maybe persistence or we try to jump to another asset in the same network. But before diving in, into details, I would like to highlight these points. As we already said, this is a post exploitation technique, which means that we should already have a compromised asset and it should provide us the, the following requirements. So first, we need to have the certificates, obviously, to, to get authenticated in etcd. And the second requirement is the etcd service must be reachable. It could be locally or, or remotely. And it's worth noting that this technique only works in self-managed environments, and also it works in, in environments where etcd is implemented as a cluster. We just need to compromise one of the etcd nodes. And however, we won't be able to apply this technique in managed environments because you already know etcd is not reachable in, in control planes that are configured by the cloud providers. And here's a brief reminder about what is, what is etcd. And as you know, it's a key value store and it's usually located uh, in, in a control plane node or bound to the control plane node in, in another host. And Kubernetes, it, it uses uh, etcd for baking up all the cluster data. So we can consider etcd as a kind of living backup. And it's constantly updating the state of the cluster components. And talking about backups, we, what, what should happen, what would happen if we have a legacy system on which we have backups or dumps that are not encrypted or are not encoded or not serialized. We have just backups in, in raw data. So what would happen if someone has access to these backup files? Well, most likely an attacker could use these files to obtain, of course, sensitive information. Let's say hard-code passwords in configuration files or maybe could retrieve private keys for uh, SSH, or even worse, it could modify or inject malicious files waiting for this backup to be restored and gain a compromised asset within the network. So based on this principle, I was obsessed kind of into finding a way to um, reproduce this, this same principle in, in etcd. But first things first, uh, how does etcd work? And as we mentioned, is a key value store, which is a simple concept. You can add keys and values, which are associated to, to those keys. 
and you can, if you know a key path, you can retrieve its value or delete the key, and basically that's all, it's quite simple. Then what happens when, for example, we create a pod? Well, the API server will take our request and will instruct the etcd to store this value in, in a specific key. In this case, it will use all the information of the pod manifest as a value, and the key will be located usually at uh, slash registry, slash pods, slash defaults, slash nginx in this example. And this is just an example. You know that not all resources in Kubernetes are namespaced, so not all resources will follow this path uh, structure. However, most of the namespaces objects, like deployments or stateful sets or service accounts, will be safe following this, this structure. But that was uh, just a high-level overview of, of the entire process. It's actually more complex. And this workflow is much more detailed. I, I won't detail every single step here. I just want to highlight that the API server is in constant communication with the etcd at every single step. And when the API communicates with the scheduler, for example, it updates the state in etcd. When the API server communicates with the kubelet, it tries to update uh, the information in etcd. Even when the kubelet receive uh, some updated information in, sorry, I lost my okay, mouse, okay, right here. Even when the um, QAPI server receives information from the kubelet, it also tries again to update this information in, in etcd. So as you can see, etcd is in the middle of every single communication managed by the API server, so we can agree that it's a key component in, in the cluster, right? Now we can retrieve this information about the newly created pod from etcd. And it's quite simple. With this command, we specify where the service is, is located. In this case, it's in exposed just in, in the local host. But if we have the etcd in, in a remote cluster, we should just change the, the endpoint. And, and we also have to specify the files that we use for, uh, for the authentication against etcd, and finally we indicate with, uh, with the command get that we want to obtain the value of the following key. In this case, it's our pod called nginx. And we have this. If we take all the information from etcd, we get this string, and it appears to be something like a JSON, but it also contains a special non-readable characters. It's strange. But this is actually the pod data serialized with a protobuf format. And you may wonder, what is protobuf? And, and how does it work? Well, it's just to put it simple, here is just an example on how to use protobuf, how to serialize data from a, from a person in this case. And first, first of all, um, we'll need a protofile that will define the structure of the data that we want to serialize. In this case, we want, for example, to include the name, age, and an email. And then with the command below, you can create a module that can be imported into your Python script, and there we can create the serialized object. And here at the right, you have the output in byte format. But what happens if we want to serialize another thing, not a person? What if we want to serialize a book or a car? Then these objects do not have the same parameters as a person. So we should create uh, additional uh, proto files and, and more structures. And this is the problem that we have in, in Kubernetes. We have several objects, and all of them are defined in a different ways. As you know, a service account is not defined with the same parameters as a network policy, and a pod is not defined with the same parameters as a role binding. So what happens if we want to serialize these different objects? Because we will need to know the, the structure of everyone. And fortunately for me, <laughs> there is already a tool available that allows us to serialize and deserialize entries in etcd. 
And it's the tool that I mentioned in, in the beginning and was presented by Joe Best at KubeCon North America in 2018. And this tool basically enables us to pass a serialized object through a pipe and it converts uh, into a YAML or, or a JSON. And similarly, we can manually modify this YAML file and then we can try to serialize it again and put it back into etcd. It's quite simple. Basically, this is what we start from etcd and the previous tool, Auger, will return us this beautiful YAML. Crazy. So I start playing with this tool, testing some changes in those extracted YAML files, and then put it back into etcd just to see how the cluster reacts. And I found some interesting results. So I thought that it would be a good idea to create a wrapper for this tool that automates the, the entire process. And you can see here in the middle, let's say, tricks. And I'm going to explain in detail what are those tricks. So here I've detailed the entire workflow of this wrapper called Kubet CD, along with some of the tricks involved. And first, we need to select a resource that is already in the cluster. And we'll use this resource as a template. Uh, this tool does not work with raw YAMLs. And at the moment, I have only implemented pods, but this could be done with any other resource in, in the cluster. Then first, we deserialize this pod template. We take the YAML. And the first trick is that we need to create a new UID, which can be randomized. And if we do not change this UID, it may create some cross-reference between objects and may result in inconsistencies and malfunctions of the API logic, yeah, API server logic. And there is an interesting aspect here. Uh, when the pods reach the running state, a new hash will be created and linked to this pod, and also it serves as the container ID as well. And we can simply remove this hash, and everything will go fine. Perfect. And now we have modified the template. We have changed the UID. We have uh, removed the hash. Now we have the bare minimum, the basis, to create a, a new pod and make some, some changes. For example, let's say we could modify the um, creation timestamp, could be. Or we can turn in a regular pod into a privileged one. And we can also experiment with some creating, creating some inconsistencies, which I will show you shortly. And after making these changes, we can serialize this modified object, and we try to put it back into etcd. So here we, far, so here we have the first example. It's nothing really harmful. And we have our pod and Jinx running, and with the wrapper Qubit CD, we can simply modify the creation timestamp. And suddenly, as you can see here, the pod appears to be running for 23 years without a restart. And it's a remarkable achievement because it has been running even before the Kubernetes was, was created. And you want to take a picture of this? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a second scenario, and I was thinking about what would happen if, if the name in the pod, uh, in the pod manifest does not match with the name in the etcd path. Look, here we create a new pod called Nginx Persistent, and then I implement the dash p argument to create a custom path. In this case, the path will be called random entry, but could be any, any name. So if we list the, the pods, we can see the Nginx persistent pod running. However, if we try to delete this pod, we'll get an error telling that this pod is not found. And that's normal, because from the API logics per perspective, this pod does not exist, because the real name in etcd is random entry and it does not match with the name in the, in the manifest. So in this case, we won't be able to remove the pod using the API server through kubectl or any other client. 
Instead of, we must delete this pod uh, directly from etcd. It's the only way to remove this pod from, from the cluster. And I found this previous scenario funny, so I thought, hey, what happened if I change the namespace? Uh, so here I create a new pod called Nginx Hidden, and now you can guess what will happen. Let's gonna try to find this pod. So we have just created our pod in a non-existent namespace. So if we check the default namespace, we cannot see our pod. It's not here, it's not in the default namespace, apparently. And if we try to find our new invisible namespace that we defined in the previous slide right here, um, it doesn't exist either. So where is our pod? Any guess? Any guesses? You know, where is the pod? It's in the, in the heaven of the pod? No, it's in the default namespace. Our pod has been always in the default namespace uh, because we didn't change this value in the, in the manifest. It's just changed the etcd path. So when we run kubectl get pods, the API server iterates over the default namespace path in etcd and this pod is not under this path. However, if we list all the pods in all namespaces, it will iterate over the, the pods path, and that's how we can find our pod here. Well, as a security consultant, when a customer seeks uh, a Kubernetes assessment, one of my main concerns is deploying secure workloads. And you already know that Kubernetes has some built-in features for deploying secure workloads, such as you know, security context and all its parameters. And we can also apply Secom, AppArmor, Linux, and furthermore, we have also cool third-party solutions to protect our cluster. But for now, we'll focus on, on, on built-in features. But you know, nobody's perfect. And we could miss setting these configurations in accordance with our security standards of our organization. So we need to implement some policies to, to ensure and to enforce that our design configuration uh, will be applied. And this is where the admission controllers come into play. You already know that uh, about the deprecation of pod security policies. Now we have the pod security admissions which define three pod security standards. And as in names indicates, the most restrictive is the restricted standard. And it requires many security parameters. And as a validation and mission controller, we must comply every single of its uh, directives if we want our workload to be, to be deployed. As you already know, pod security admissions apply only to namespaces, so let's create the most restrictive namespace ever called restricted namespace, restricted NS. And here you have the definition. And what happens if we try to deploy just a single pod? Uh, it's not even a, a privileged pod. Well, the policy admission will not validate this insecure configuration and this pod won't be deployed in this uh, restricted namespace. Here, I just highlight some of the missing configurations. Uh, it's, it's, uh, we have to disallow the privilege escalation, the capabilities, and the run as non-root. And do you think it's possible to deploy a privileged pod in a restricted namespace? because it is, if we deploy directly through etcd. So here I implemented the privilege flag to turn any template into a, into a privilege one. And as you can see here, we managed to deploy a privilege pod in a restricted namespace by bypassing completely the pod security admissions defined in the namespace. And time for a demo. I think I'm going so fast. Uh, let me share the internet with my, because I need to pull some images. Hold on. And 
demo time. Okay, you have to see, okay, the same screen as me. And I should connect. My iPhone, yeah. Please don't hack my iPhone. And, okay. Now we have um, three, three panels, and here we have the, the administrator and console. This is the cluster admin. It's legit, nothing wrong. Here then we have a compromise control plane. So the etcd is running here. And we have another remote machine that belongs to the, to the attacker. So let's gonna see what is running here. We have just an, an nginx. Let's gonna see what we have. We have many things running. We have Kiverno also implemented. Nothing, nothing really harmful, everything in place. Okay, so now here from the compromised um, control plane, we can run, uh, oh, let me show you something. I'm gonna try to run a privilege uh, Nginx. Of course, it, it doesn't work because the kubectl, um, we have implemented the kubernetes policies to avoid privilege pods in all the, the clusters, so it, it doesn't matter the the namespace, and here with this fancy wrapper, I will kubectl cd, I will create a pod that I will call it um, nginx prep, let's say. I will use the, the running nginx um, pod as a template, and I will say, hey, I want it privilege. Let's gonna Try this thing. I'm gonna use uh, a watch. Yes, you can see what is happening on real time. Okay, and cross finger, and here it's creating the pod, holding the image. It's running, and the big question is: Is this pod really privileged? Okay, let's get kubectl get and jinx prep, and I will get this in YAML. I don't have the mouse here. Uh, and jinx prep, get, oh, get pot. And here, if we find the secure context, secure context should be around here. Uh, 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 here, here we have it. We have a privileged pod running in a Kiverno protected cluster. And in addition, we have, I've also had not only this uh, flag, but it's also sharing the, these namespaces, IPC network and PAD. Well, that's crazy, right? But we can do more fancy things. That's gonna say, hey, I want a reverse shell into an external machine. I'll try to get um, my IP. I think it's, let me check. No, it's not this one. Remember that this demo is running in, in kind, so I'm looking for the Docker IP. Docker zero interface IP. Okay. Case clipboard. Thank you. No. Okay. Anyway, I will be listening on this port, and here I should have in the history. Um, okay. Got it. Got it. Okay. Here with this command, I will try to get a reverse shell directly from, from inside the, the, the pod, and we'll try to create a fake um, namespace, and also we'll try to use uh, a fake name 
or the etcd path. We'll try to watch again what's happening in the cluster. And that's going to do this. Oh, what happened? We have here a remote shell. As you can see, we have no new pods here. There is nothing. Of course, kubectd get pods slash a. Uh, let me check. Let me reduce this. We have here the new pod remote shell in the default namespace, but as a legit cluster, I mean, I will try to delete this pod call and jinx remote shell. I cannot. <laughs> so, okay, let me check where I am. I cannot use this one, host name. I'm directly in the worker. I've also, in the parameters, I uh, add the option to mount the root file system in, in this file system, in host. And despite this error, we have um, full access PSF in it. Oh, no, sorry. PSF. Oh, I lost my... Anyway, I had full access to the control. I'm going to try again. That's it. We have root access, full access to the control, uh, to the node, sorry. And this could be also, there is another flag telling, hey, I want to move to another node. That's quite simple, just using node name. I'm not sure if this will be, it will work. Not sure, not sure, not sure, not sure, no. Anyway. The thing is, I'm going to stop this and turn it back to the presentation. Sorry. Okay. Nope, not this. Now. Okay, and here comes the big question. Why does this work? Why this happens? And to be honest, I have not analyzed the Kubernetes code, but all the tests demonstrate that the implementation of etcd in the Kubernetes architecture provides a level of reliability regarding the API that Kubernetes clients do not have. And as a users, we are subject to authentication, to authorization process based on roles, and finally, to admission controllers that even cluster admins cannot bypass without disabling them. However, etcd only needs its certificates to get authenticated, uh, and then everything it, it, uh, in etcd will be trusted as, as valid. And the thing is, how can we mitigate this threat? Is that possible? Because attackers here have an advantage, and this technique affects, you know, a very specific environment. And there are, at least to my knowledge, there are no a widely adopted solution that serve as, as de facto standard for checking the integrity of etcd. And if we had to respond a security ends incident that exploit this technique, the, the, the events on Kubernetes, they are also stored in etcd, so they are completely compromised. Even we have uh, root access to the node, so if the logs are safe in any node of the cluster, could be also compromised. And however, we have runtime security solutions that could provide 
early alerts. It, it's something un, unusual. It's happening in the cluster as your, your tool. And especially, you know, uh, endpoint security, runtime security solutions could detect uh, easily processes that are running on the node. For example, obtaining a remote shell, it's, it's obvious. And as we have seen, gaining root shell access on any cluster node, it's quite easy, even using images that are not intended for offensive exercise. Remember that this image use, it's Jinx latest. There is no offensive image at all. So finally, let's wrap up some conclusions here. As we have seen, this technique, um, when all the requirements are met, it's, it's very powerful and it can compromise the entire cluster in, in a matter of seconds. And if you check any book or blog post or anything related on how to exploit a compromise etcd, you will find that in most of cases, they treat etcd just uh, as a database from which we can retrieve secrets. But now we have demonstrated that etcd is a key component of the Kubernetes architecture and perhaps it's the most important and the most critical one. And sadly, despite all this, remember that this technique, it won't work on managed environments. And now I would like to pose a question to you and the community. Uh, I won't answer it. And the thing is, uh, should the trusted position that etcd currently holds in the Kubernetes architecture should be reconsidered? What do you think? And I hope you catch me out there and share your thoughts uh, about it. And that's all. Thank you. That was us. Do you have any question? No? Yep. Yep. OK. Yeah, it is. Yeah, yes. Well, indeed. It, it was not a screenshot, it, it was my Kali, indeed, yeah. No questions? Oh, over there. Now, uh, thanks for your fantastic uh, presentation. Now I have, uh, okay. Uh, now I have, uh, uh, now I have a technique to exploit uh, the ETCD. So how do I get access to the ETCD? Uh, uh, or in other ways, uh, what's the common pitfalls in current KBIS management to, to let the attacker have the access to the ETCD EC, uh, database? Uh, you, sorry, you are asking if we have anything to, to, to be safe against this technique? Uh, 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 I'm asking if there are any common pitfalls to let the attacker access the ATCD database? I, I don't know, to be honest. Uh, so how do I to exploit this, uh, the ATCD? The, with, what, what's the common ways to? Uh, yeah, usually the common way is just to, if you get the, the credentials, I mean the, um, the certificates, uh, usually if you check some blog posts and, and books and all the information we have on the internet, most of times they are uh, treating etcd just uh, a place where you can retrieve secrets, and that's all. Uh, so, okay, so uh, 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 does the etcd certificate uh, is stored in the work node? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. It, uh, I, I, get, I get the point. Yes, uh, for sure, yeah. First you have to compromise the, the control plane or the etcd node. But this is not covered by, by this presentation. Okay, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Okay, I got this. Okay, okay. thank you. It, it, wouldn't be, it wouldn't be easy to compromise, uh, for sure. But sometimes, you know, some system administrators will like to put some services in, in the same node and, you know. And the thing is, security is, is multi-layer. I mean, if let's... It's an, an example. If we have an image that it's, it's configured to run, uh, to run a user that is not root, it's image that is properly configured in the Docker file, 
it doesn't mean that we do not have to use admission controllers to avoid running pods or containers running as root. I mean, it's okay, it's pretty difficult to, to compromise a control plane, it's pretty difficult to compromise an HCD node that only runs HCD, but the thing works until it doesn't work. I mean, uh, vulnerabilities are always uh, arise every day. We, we have already seen the supply chain attacks. Mm, I think this could be also secure in, in any sense. HCD should be, in my opinion, mm, also um, restricted by the mission controllers. Yeah, that's the point. Uh, you, hi, you basically answered my question, so thanks. Okay. <laughs> Great. Hi, I have a question. Um, in your demo, we noticed that we created a pod uh, with a path that uh, an invisible namespace in the path. So I wonder why we can use kubectl get pod dash a to show the pod. Um, but uh, we cannot delete the, this part. Sorry, yeah. I, I, I don't get it. <laughs> okay, uh, let me <coughs> reproduce my question. So you created a part yeah. uh, directly through etcd, yes. uh, your, co your code etcd, yeah. with a pass, uh, the namespace name is invisible. Yep. Yeah, so we cannot uh, uh, get the part without a dash A. Yes. What's the... Uh, um, but and uh, but with dash a we can see that part. Yes, because yeah yeah yeah. Okay, got it. Um, the thing is, when you run slash a with getting all the information, the the API goes to etcd and go to slash registry slash pods and iterates over this path, and it gets everything on this path. Okay, so when we try to delete uh, this part, uh, oh, can we? Uh, oh, because we don't have a namespace uh, named uh, invisible, so we yeah, cannot it's, delete it. It's in the etcd path. It's a slash registry, a slash port, a slash invisible. But the thing is, when in kubectl we try to remove this pod or to check this pod, it's taking the value of the namespace from the manifest. And it doesn't match. It creates an inconsistency, and you cannot okay. find with with other command. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yep. Ready? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>